Hello, my friend. Before we start this amazing episode, I want to invite you to the personal Patreon page of this podcast. If you love what's being done here and want to keep the podcast and the meditations free to the public, then you can come on over to our brand new community on Patreon and donate $11.11 a month and all proceeds will go towards keeping this free, keeping this going. Plus, we'll be building a community together and I'll give you bonus material. You can explore this option in the description of this podcast or just go to patreon.com slash Dr. Reese. Let's begin. Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. So can stress actually create chronic pain in the body? (laughs) Welcome to episode number 106. Today, I'm sitting down to talk with Dan Buglio. He's a TMS coach. TMS is the mind-body syndrome, also known as tension mineral syndrome, coined by Dr. Sarno in the 70s. So sit down, relax, and take in this beautiful invaluable recording let's begin hello dan welcome to the podcast thanks man how do you describe what tms is it's something that was discovered in the 70s by dr john sarno he kind of put the pieces together between chronic pain and psychology Mm. and how the in most cases, the body is not the problem. Mm. In most cases, it has to do with stress, tension, emotions. He theorized Mm. about repressed negative emotions as being perceived by the brain as this dangerous thing, and the brain needed to essentially protect us from those emotions that were too overwhelming, scary, or or dangerous. Um, And those theories are really fascinating and have led to probably millions of people getting better over the past 40, 50 years, however long since he started introducing it. But I don't know how we prove that theory correct. Is it a distraction mechanism? Is the brain truly trying to distract us from our emotions? Is it more of a cause and effect that we've just got all of this emotional turmoil, unfelt emotions, and that creates a lot of both mental, psychological, and even physical changes, you know, hormonal, stress response, all that kind of stuff. Somehow pain starts, and then through fear, focus, and attention on it, the brain learns that, oh, we've got a problem. And, you know, most chronic pain, in my opinion, has become learned. There are various theories on what causes the pain in the first place, but I believe most pain that lasts a long period of time has been learned by the brain and the nervous system to just keep on repeating as a way to keep us safe from perceived yeah. dangers, whether it be movement, emotional stress, whatever. Uh, I like to joke, it's too much stress. Yeah. Well, that would make sense, that abbreviation, but uh, it's sure. tension myoneural syndrome, right? Yeah, it was tension myositis, and then he realized nerves were involved, tension myoneural and towards yeah. the end of Dr. Sarno's career, he just called it the mind-body syndrome, TMS. And there's a number of different acronyms these days, um, you know, by some other people as well, um, some other doctors who are carrying on the, the work, some yeah. other people in the space. So, so essentially, it's pain that originates in the brain. It is not as a result of a normal structural abnormality like bulging, herniated disc, whatever it may be. Yeah. Those things are often pointed at as the blame, but they're in many cases not the blame because many people with horrible MRIs get better once they realize that, hey, we age, we're not perfect, and those things don't have to cause a lifetime of chronic pain. So, and I, I've uh, been kind of trying to carry on that work with the things I've been doing. 
Yeah. I experienced it personally years ago. And so the most famous pain would be back pain. I mean, it's a, like a billion dollar industry and Dr. Sarno's work originally was, you know, focused on back uh, yeah, I mean, pain. that was the, yeah, that was the title of his first two books. Yeah. Mind over back pain and healing back pain. But then in his third book, it was the mind body prescription, yeah. which he expanded into all sorts of various symptoms. Got that right here. Yeah, exactly. I've got one as well. And then later, uh, the divided mind. He got very into the psychological aspect of this. Um, some of the newer doctors are a little bit more along the uh, the nervous system end of this and the hypersensitivity of the nervous system. And the cool part is, in my opinion, we don't need to know exactly what theory is correct. Yeah. A hypervigilant nervous system, a distraction. Some people in, you know, in the world of health will say that the, the body is trying to send you a message by hurting. And what's that message? We need to find the message. It could be a, a distraction, a reaction in the nervous system. It could be a message. In my opinion, it doesn't really matter what theory you subscribe to. Yeah. Because number one, you can't prove any one of them are accurate because right. how do you understand the inner workings of the human brain for creating the pain in the first place? Right. But at least we know that there's a solution, which is accurate knowledge that your body's not broken. And then a lot of what I do is teaching the brain that we're actually safe or we don't need this pain. And when the brain doesn't perceive danger, then it can literally settle down the entire nervous system and these symptoms can go away, which is fantastic. And, and the symptoms uh, could be headaches, migraines, it could be insomnia. It could be anything. Anxiety, yeah, anxiety, of course. Anxiety is a, an equivalent. Yeah. Uh, but there's back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, headaches, pelvic pain, facial pain, you know, all sorts of neuralgias, things so, that have medical labels that are really scary. Yeah. Oftentimes are this stuff, burning, tingling, numbness, weakness, all of these things can manifest as a result of this nervous system that's on overload. And the more afraid we are and the more we focus on it, the longer the system symptoms persist. Mm. Really kind of wild. Mm -hmm. It's about letting go and accepting. <laughs> yes. That's a lot of the recommendations is acceptance. Accurate knowledge is absolutely a big portion of it. The yeah. fact that this bulging disc on your MRI has nothing to do with why you're hurting so bad. Yeah. Because in many cases, some of the people with these chronic symptoms are experiencing pain at a level that exceeds what's possible through like a medical problem. Surgery, injuries don't hurt as bad as some of this stuff. It's like this type of pain can far exceed what can happen as a result of surgeries or injuries or illness even. It's amazing. It is and, amazing. Uh, the mind-body connection is just, just so powerful. I like to point out that I don't think it's a mind-body connection. I think it's one system. Emotions are felt in the body. You're choked up. You got a heavy heart. You got, oh, I felt like a kick in the gut when something, you know, somebody hurt your feelings. People say that the, uh, the pain in our body is unfelt emotional pain. I don't know. It's another theory, but how do we prove it? Yeah, so pain is essentially an alarm system. Yes. So if, let's say, your left knee is hurting, well, it's either hurting because you banged it or you were running too much or your mind is, it, this is Dr. Sarno's theory, your mind is creating that pain as a distraction to cover up your, let's just say your childhood anger or, you know, the frustration that you didn't become what you wanted to or. It certainly can be. I do less with the psychological analysis, like the inner child work or things of that sort, um, because I think that kind of takes you down this rabbit hole, the, the distraction theory, that it's the repressed emotions, it's childhood traumas, it's that type of stuff, lends us to believe that, well, if I want to get better, then I have to go find or figure out yeah. what the cause was. Mm. Well, the challenge with that is many people spend weeks, months, years, decades on this psychological analysis. People who have been in therapy for 13 years, they still have pain. They know their childhood inside and out. 
They feel they've handled and resolved all their past traumas. So why do they still hurt? Because the pain can be learned. It may have been why the pain started. But I'm not convinced that this childhood trauma, in all cases, is the reason it still persists. Because again, think about it this way. If the brain perceives you got a bad back every time you bend over, the brain's going to go, stop, don't do that. That's dangerous. Right. Or you got a bum knee. Hey, what are you doing going on that long walk? Stop that. And people say, I felt good on the walk, but the next day, boy, did I pay for it. I must have overdone it. No, the brain is literally saying, what were you thinking yesterday? Don't do that again today. Here's some pain to make sure you don't. Because you've thought and said out loud hundreds of times, I got a bad knee. Right, And so I think it becomes learned. It becomes a conditioned response, which is a term Sarno used. And this this learned behavior is essentially the subconscious mind, right? That's the basement that stores all the sure junk and it's programming. Yeah, the brain is the brain is doing its job to keep us safe, keep us alive. Yeah. And if it perceives that taking a long walk is dangerous, it will activate pain in a familiar place. Yeah. Or in some cases it will keep it active. I mean, I, I know People I've worked with, people who are bedridden, they they are so in such avoidance of I don't want to hurt, so I don't do anything, and their world grows from here to this little tiny box called my bedroom. Yeah, so it's it's really devastating the the number of people. Um, it's a global issue. This is not a Western issue. Everybody around the globe has this. I've worked with clients, Australia, Japan, Korea. The Netherlands, Europe, UK, Spain, South America, North America, Canada, like virtually everywhere. And it's a global issue because it's a human issue. And I really appreciate your videos on YouTube and Facebook. They're very simple. And, you know, your objective seems to be to just get people to teach your brain that you're safe. Yes. It's all good. And to create indifference. It's like indifference is the weapon. <laughs> That's the mighty sword that right. cuts the facade. It's ultimately acceptance. Ultimately. Yes. Acceptance Except and indifference are, are cousins. They're very similar. Yeah. Uh, and I point out in the videos, I say, look, acceptance doesn't mean you are resolving to be this way for the rest of your life. It just means you are accepting where you are right now. Because people who get upset, angry, rageful at the fact that they're in this pain, um, there's so much resistance. And what do they say? Whatever you resist persists. And there is brain science going on here too. There's neuroplasticity. What happens to the things you think about and focus on most often? The brain starts to develop this wiring, these pathways. And so if you're constantly thinking about fearing it, frustrated with it, trying to fix it and get rid of it. All you're doing all day long is talking this language of pain. Yeah. And so how's it going to go away? Wiring and firing. Yeah, exactly. And so accurate knowledge will help you dial down the fear. Right? Once you're no longer afraid of it, it's easier to get to that state of indifference and like, okay, I hurt today. So what? I know I'm not broken. I know it's, I'm not, you know, nothing horrible is happening. And I, at that point, when you're no longer afraid, it's easier to shift your attention back to living your life at whatever capacity that may be available to you. Some people are like, but I hurt so bad, I can't live my life. You can either lay in bed catastrophizing and fearing your future and worrying and throwing that huge pity party for yourself, or you can lay in bed and call up a friend and not talk about your pain and find out what's going on in their life or you know, watch a funny comedy movie or silly cat videos. There's a difference between a huge despairing laying in bed all the time and saying, okay, I can't do much yet physically yet. So I'm going to make the best of it. I am where I am. All right. So that's the acceptance and indifference looks like this. Okay. I hurt today. So what I did yesterday and I made it through yesterday. So I'll make it through today. Because the opposite is freaking out. And you've probably heard me say that in the videos. Like, mm -hmm, the freak out. If you yeah. can't be indifferent, at least don't freak out. Why? Because when you're freaking out, you're screaming to the brain, I'm in danger. 
And what does the brain do when you're in danger? Stress response, adrenaline, cortisol, Mm -hmm. everything amplifies blood flow, heart rate, Mm -hmm. you know, blood pressure, nervous system just starts buzzing. Mm -hmm. It's not going to calm down when you're in that state of freak out. Nope. And so there's a lot of benefit to calming the body physically with breathing and relaxing the muscles, calming the brain by not taking your thinking so seriously. Right. Just observing your thoughts and saying, oh, that was a dark, scary thought, but I don't have to engage with that today. I don't have to ruminate on it and repeat it mm-hmm. 50 times. I can literally just go, wow. Yeah, I just thought I might never get better, but I don't have to believe that thought either. It's That's just right. a thought. Yeah. So calming your body, calming your um, your thinking and mind. And then when it comes to emotions, I don't suggest we have to go journaling about what happened in third grade. But at least give yourself the benefit of experiencing whatever you're feeling in the moment. Mm. So if you are angry, if you are sad, if you have grief, allow yourself to feel it. Feel the feelings. Right. All of those are messages to the brain that goes, yeah, emotions are safe. Why? Because I'm feeling them and I'm still okay. Safety physically is like if you're all chill and relaxed and just breathing comfortably, The brain has no choice but to interpret that to mean you're safe, Mm -hmm. as opposed to how many people walk around, shallow breathing, they're tense, they're tight, they're a ball of protection, right? They're like, yeah. so that's just screaming danger, danger, danger. The system's not going to settle down if you're doing that. So I talk a lot about awareness, awareness of your emotional state, feel, awareness of your physical state, breathe and relax attention from your body. Awareness of your mental state, and if it's spinning on on high speed with all these fearful, catastrophic, worrisome thoughts, I don't have to do anything with them. I can just literally leave them be and then shift my attention towards something a little bit more positive. That doesn't mean I'm fixing and stopping my thinking. Because if you had to stop and, and fix all of your thoughts, that would be exhausting. But we don't have to take them seriously. And I think that combination of the mindset of indifference along with the awareness of your emotional, physical, and mental state and doing those couple of things along with the accurate knowledge that says I'm not broken. I've seen people literally on coaching calls go, oh my God, I'm okay. Mm. I'm not broken. I'm not broken physically, mentally, or emotionally. Because people come to the conclusion, well, Dr. Sarno talked about these repressed emotions. So the first response to TMS is, this is fantastic. My body's okay. And then they go, oh no, what does that mean about my brain Mm. or my emotions? Does that mean I have an emotional problem or a mental problem that's causing this? And then they feel broken all over again because they think they're broken mentally or emotionally. And I'm saying you're not any of them. You didn't do anything wrong to get where you are. You just happened to get here. And so my job through the daily videos, some coaching and all that kind of stuff is to point people in the right direction, which is relax, you're not broken. You just thought you were. And we just have to teach your brain that you're not broken. Once it gets the message, these symptoms can fade away. That's really my whole approach. It's not terribly complex. And one of the things is how x-rays and MRIs can kind of enhance the freak out, right? Of course. Yeah, I like to call that getting medicalized, Hmm. right? Because you have pain, it sticks around a little while. So, oh, shoot, I got to go to the doctor. You start going to the doctor, here's some pain meds. That doesn't work. All right, maybe go to the chiropractor. He orders some x rays. Oh, you've got degenerative disc disease. Uh oh, what the hell does that mean? Right? I was in my 30s. I was told I had some degeneration in my spine. Great, thanks. And so we start to get medicalized, which is traumatized by the medical system. And there's actually a term called uh, vomit, victim of medical imaging technology, mm. which essentially means MRIs can see inside the body with a level of detail never before in history. And what happens? An MRI exactly. that shows yeah. a bulging or herniated disc or spondylolisthesis where the discs are a little bit out of alignment or a spinal canal is narrow. Yeah, that gets and, downloaded into the subconscious, into the And people freak out. And then they come to the conclusion that I'm broken. And they're told they're broken. And doctors will literally say things like, 
Yeah, get used to it because it's probably not getting better. It's probably just going to get worse over time until you eventually need surgery. Mm. Thanks, Doc. It's called a nocebo. It's the opposite of a placebo. A nocebo is basically a statement or something you read or heard or, or learned that something is bad for you, like living inside of your body, which is devastating. And because it comes from this authority figure with the white lab coat, a fancy degree on the wall, yeah. it's, it's readily accepted as fact. It's not fact because there's plenty of people with those same MRIs who don't have pain. It's a rabbit hole, you know, the, your regular physician passes you to a specialist. And then next thing you know, you got three appointments a week and, and you're, you're everywhere. You're and going you're to- on 10 different drugs and you yeah. are going for 18 different treatments and none of them seem to work. And you just become more and more desperate and full of despair. I mean, I've literally spoken to people who have had uh, one lady had nine surgeries mm. to try to cure a neuralgia issue. She said she spent over $200,000 out of pocket mm. and she still had pain because her brain always perceived she had an, a problem with her nerves. As long as the brain perceived that, it was going to keep the pain going because it that's what it believed and it acts on her instructions. Yeah. So... Wow. It, it's really fascinating. And, you know, you talked about the dollar consequence, you know, back pain, billion dollar business. Well, if you look at chronic pain in general, mm. I think in the United States alone, they're estimating like one out of three has some type of chronic pain sim- syndrome. And when you factor in not only the treatment costs, but the lack of productivity and income and everything else, it's probably a $600 billion a year problem in the United States alone, let alone globally. Yeah, it's the same with diseases. It, oh, of course. They're, they're managers. They manage the disease or they manage the pain. They right. don't cure. The only thing that can be cured is an infection. But we know that antibiotics and things like that are very known and proven. But the good part is any true injuries heal. If you break a bone and you set it properly, it's going to heal just perfectly. And one of the stories I like to share is a, a guy I know who used to teach my son how to road, ride uh, motorcycles on the dirt. You know, this guy's been riding motocross since he was four and he's 50 now. And he's been doing it at a competitive level, like a national competition. And this guy has crashed and broken so many of his bones, so many surgeries, so many broken bones. He's 50 years old. And you know, if you looked at his medical history, it's a stack this high. He doesn't have chronic pain, but yet he's busted himself up in ways that none of us can even imagine. The body heals. Oh, I've got a football injury that never healed. Really? When did you cut yourself and it never healed? Right. When did you burn yourself and it never healed? When did you fall down and like skin your elbow and it never healed? The body heals. Every day. All the time. You know, but the belief that says, you know, I, I, had a story from a lady who had knee surgery several years ago and she didn't want to have it. She was pushed into it and she was devastated by the amount of post-surgical pain, which was real because they literally cut into her knee. It was real pain, but she freaked out because there was regret. I shouldn't have done that. I knew this wasn't going to go well. And because there was so much focus on it, her brain kept believing there's still a problem. She convinced herself that the, the surgery was botched. But they messed her up. They nicked a nerve. They did something. And despite three or four more MRIs from other knee specialists that say, no, everything looks perfect. It's it's completely healed. Everything should be fine. She was so convinced that the doctor messed up the surgery that her brain behaved as if she had a bad knee. Stairs, long walks, all that kind of stuff hurt like crazy. She couldn't move because she had convinced her brain she had a bum knee. And the brain was acting as if she really did. It's amazing. But there was nothing wrong with the surgery. The, you know, it, it healed three years ago. So it's fascinating. So I really look at all chronic pain, except for disease like cancer type of stuff. There's absolutely some, some factors there with tumors and things like that. But infections, like you said, can be cured, treated, healed. Uh, fractures can be set and the bones heal. Like even the biggest bone in the body, the femur. The upper part of the leg, six, eight weeks. 
it's right. stronger at the break point than it is on the other parts of the bone. Yeah. So it's, it's really fascinating. And uh, because of my experience, I just became fascinated with it. And now fortunately I'm able to help some other people get out of pain. Yeah. So the proper mindset is to get out of the white coat road, <laughs> get out of the white coat hole. Yeah. Right. Once, once you know, it's not, something super duper severe, like, like say a cancer. Cancer, infectious disease and fractures. You want to identify them because most fractures do require, require a medical intervention of setting the bone properly. So it's right. So brand new pains, if it's severe, get checked out, rule out the life threatening, which is one of the rules of thumb by uh, some of the current doctors who are practicing in this space. But then after you rule out the life threatening, you rule in this thing called TMS or the mind body syndrome. And there's various, you know, uh, behaviors. People will be like, Oh, I wake up in tons of pain, but at night I'm feeling much better or the opposite. I wake up in such pain and, uh, you know, or the opposite. I wake up pain free. And by lunchtime, here comes the pain. Well, structure doesn't behave that way. If you truly had a structural problem, why would it work on a schedule? Right. And there's, any number of things. People have less pain when not they're on vacation or when they are engaged with family or friends, but then when they're sitting on the couch by themselves and they start doing what? Thinking about it. <laughs> Brain goes, oh, here's your pain. And, and there's actually, you know, ways of assessing whether or not your symptoms or pains are from this mind-body process yeah. or structural issues. So rule out the life-threatening, rule in this thing called TMS, and uh, once you know it's TMS, that's it. Yeah. It, there is not a middle ground where it says, well, maybe it is my herniated disc. No, your pain is not behaving like a herniated disc. Your pain's behaving like TMS, which is this mind-body thing. Yeah. And there's several ways of trying to figure that stuff out. But People tend to catastrophize. They Oh yeah. That mind is powerful. Once, once it, once it gets attached to something, a, a 10 second thought could turn into a 10 day marathon spiral. nightmare. Yeah. A spiral. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, the brain is our best friend. It's been trying to keep us safe and keep us alive forever. But a lot of what's in the subconscious has been learned for our upbringing. And so if you had a highly anxious parent, who is always worried that you're going to get sick or you're going to have this happen or that happen and don't do that. You're going to die. Or, you know, you may have experienced, you know, a friend get hit by a car when you were young or, you, I mean, all sorts of scenarios that teach us and our brain to say, wow, that was scary. Your nervous mm -hmm. system. Be and before you know it, you're 30 years old, constantly anxious and your brain and your nervous system is always vigilant and on the lookout for danger because you've experienced a lot of early programming. Again, you know, very anxious, health anxiety type of parents. Put on a coat, you're going to get sick. Oh my God, you know? Hey. And so a big message I've got is that people who end up with these chronic symptoms didn't do anything wrong. They didn't bring this upon themselves. It's not their fault. It's just where they ended up. The good news is once you have the accurate knowledge of what's going on and you kind of see the roadmap that says, okay, here's what we do to kind of reverse it. TMS is the best news ever. Right. It beats the heck out of thinking that your, you know, your spine is the problem. So I, I don't know. I think it's, it fascinates me every day. And uh, that's why I can talk about it every day. So your story. Mm -hmm. you had a really bad back. You were all crooked and you ended up on the floor of your bedroom for a few days, didn't you? Yeah, I had, uh, it started by bending over to put on my underwear mm. and my back went out, whatever that means. Backs don't go out. I had an acute onset of pain, which of course, when that first happens and you don't know anything about this mind body stuff, you think, Oh my God, what did I do? I did, did I pull a muscle? What happened? And the first full year, it was like, it was bad for a while. I'd get a little bit better. It would happen again. And like, 
I, I had massage, chiropractic, um, some pain meds, and just really didn't get too far. And I learned about Dr. Sarno, read his first book, Healing Back Pain. All right. And I got better. I was like, yes, this is awesome. And then it came back. Three, four months later, it happened again. Whammo, another back spasm. And it took longer to get rid of it. And, you know, I got rid of it, but then it came back again. And then I couldn't get rid of it. I'm like, well, what am I doing wrong? Mm. You know, Sarno had these daily reminders. Think psychologically. Talk talk to your brain. Um, reject the physical cause of the pain. Resume physical activity. And I was like, I'm, I'm doing all that stuff. Sarno is like the original guy. He's like the, the genius. But he didn't talk about and he didn't, I guess, focus on or know about things like neuroplasticity and fear and attention and anxiety about the symptoms can cause those pathways to wire. Hmm. And as long as we're freaking out about them, I don't care how well you talk to your brain. If you're focusing on and monitoring and managing your pain all day long, you're using those neural pathways. So it took me 13 years from the time my pain started before I got rid of it. And I got rid of it before Facebook, YouTube, podcasts. There was no plethora of, you know, TMS coaches and experts out there on Instagram and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was doing it with Sarno's book, and there was like one uh, old style bulletin board. Yeah. You know, that I was going to. So I made every mistake in the book. So for anybody who's hearing this and going, holy cow, it took him 13 years. How long is it going to take me? I don't know half the stuff he knows. That's not the point. I didn't know what I know now back then, and I didn't have the resources that are available. Yeah, you can, you can spend a day on YouTube and still not get through all the content about TMS and Dr. Sarno and mind body. And there's a lot of other doctors now, Dr. Schubner, Dr. Yeah. Hanscomb, Dr. David Clark, uh, Dr. Strax, uh, Dr. Schechter. I mean, there's a lot of doctors, medical clinical doctors that treat this way. It's legit. They actually did a back pain study in Boulder, Colorado. And they use this concept and like 20 out of, out of 30 people got better. Mm. So it, it's fascinating. It's legit. It's real. It's based on science, neuroscience, you know, some really cool stuff. It's amazing what stress can do, isn't it? Stress, tension, belief systems, mm. right? Because if the brain believes you're broken, it's always going to turn on the pain. I also want to interject too that this could be, uh, stomach slash digestion issues too. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's a big yeah, one. Cause when you look at stress, it suppresses two main systems, the immune system and the digestive system. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a chronic state of stress and anxiety and fear and despair, and your body is always in this stress response, which is essentially a survival mode, it shuts down the digestive system and the immune system literally suppresses it. Yeah. Why? Because when you are in a, survival mode you're out in the woods you see a bear your brain goes oh my god we got to survive don't worry about digesting lunch don't worry about fighting the common cold those things don't matter we got to get away from this bear so heart rate goes up blood pressure goes up breathing increases eyes actually dilate to take on more information stress hormones flood the body adrenaline cortisol just amps us up so we can either run like crazy or fight like crazy mm -hmm. survival but if you're in a chronic state of stress and then you start to get these digestive issues or some sometimes immune system issues, and then you freak out about those issues, you're stressing out about a stress illness. <laughs> it's not going to get better because you're stressing out about something that was at least influenced greatly by stress. Right. And then they go on elimination diets and this diet and that diet and what do I have to do and probiotics and everything else. And they're just focusing on the problem and the body is staying in that stress response and the digestive system is still operating in a suboptimal way. Right. And so the best thing you can do if you've got IBS, colitis, gastritis, all these digestive things is to calm down. Yeah. Trust your body. It knows what to do. Get out of the stress response as much as possible. Yeah. Get into soothing recovery, rest, try to get a good night's sleep. Don't spend 18 hours a day, you know, going to WebMD and searching every type of stomach distress problem and medicine and this and that. And right. You can scare the crap out of yourself. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Yes. 
You got to get out of your own way. Yeah, just trust the body. I mean, the, the human body is absolutely incredible. And the brain knows what to do. You just got to give it the right information. Right. And unfortunately, the medicalization that happens is, you know, they scope you down your throat, up the bum. They look at you six ways to Sunday. You've got IBS. I just did a video about medical labels, how they don't help us. Now you're broken because you've got this disease called IBS, for example. Right. Yeah. And and all of a sudden now you're like, oh, no, I can't leave the house because I don't know if I if there's going to be a bathroom where I'm going. And, and these people's yeah. worlds shrink. Yeah. And then they, they go and they get into a Facebook group. A lot of the medical based groups on Facebook are, it's like haunted mansions. Yeah. Because you can literally go in there like the fibromyalgia groups, the neuralgia, pelvic pain, you know, groups, um, you name it, virtually any medical problem that is out there, there's typically a Facebook group. And the problem is they're run by people who have not found a cure. So they try to be support groups, but they're really not that supportive because there are people that are in the TMS world that come back to those other groups and they go, Hey, you know what? I got rid of my X, Y, and Z with this mind body process and they get attacked yep. and vilified. And yep. what are you talking about? I'm not imagining this. And, but, but, and it's, it's almost like in those circles, they don't want to be introduced to a cure They're, yeah. They've like just gotten so stuck in that, in that broken mentality and to no offense to them, please. If anybody in those circles is watching, no offense, but you've been given misinformation by the doctors and misinformation by the Facebook groups and Instagrams and Dr. Google that you've mm -hmm. actually been convinced Dr. that you're broken and there is no hope. Do you know how much money <laughs> would be lost by the medical establishment if this mind-body syndrome accepted and, taught? accepted and taught? Yeah, it, it would. It would be hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Hundreds the problem is the curriculum is set in the medical schools by big pharma who donates most of the money to the medical schools to build the buildings and run all that stuff. So they set the curriculum. The medical schools can't teach this stuff. As a matter of fact, I've heard that, you know, chronic pain might have, you know, less than 10 days worth of coverage in a four year medical degree. Mm -hmm. I'm talking not just pre-med, but med less than 10 days is spent on pain. These doctors come out and they don't know what to do with it. They don't understand it. And the problem is, even if you show it to them and say, hey, look, this is what's going on. They go, huh, you mean they're not broken? So that means I don't have a practice anymore. How do I make a living right. by telling people there's nothing to fix? And there's actually, uh, I'll mention him by name, give him credit. Dr. Hanscomb he is a spinal surgeon. Mm, I heard about him, yeah. Who quit right quit doing spinal surgery and now he is doing kind of like what i do and what a number of other people do which is education and helping people get out of pain through this mind body concept hmm. talk about credibility this guy is like i used to operate on spines yeah and it was ineffective enough that i didn't feel comfortable doing it anymore hmm. and he actually said on a podcast once that uh maybe one out of ten pain doctors, meaning people in the pain management world, one out of 10 feel comfortable treating chronic pain. Hmm. Only one out of 10. He said, even more surprisingly, one out of a hundred actually like it, which is ridiculous. Most doctors, you walk into their office and go, doc, I've got back pain for six months. You're caught in a headlight. Oh boy, what do I do with this? Let me get out my prescription pad. Let's see if this helps you. They don't have a solution because it's not taught to them. And in many cases, especially in the pain management world, they're not going to embrace it because that means they don't have to do anything. How do you treat a patient if you're telling them there's nothing broken? Go home. Right. And in some cases, the patient actually demands you need to do something. Isn't there some specialist I can see? Isn't there some imaging study? Can't you give me some medicine? I'm hurting. And they almost demand treatment when, in fact, there's nothing to treat. The MRI looks pretty good. There's nothing here that indicates 
why you're in such pain. The problem is they don't know enough to point them towards this stuff. And it's not their fault. They just, they're operating from the model of medicine that they were taught. Mm. I think there's very few doctors who are doing it with any ill intention. I think they just don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And therefore they have a tough time helping. Yeah. It's medical school. It's, it's, it's the foundation of their education and it's the same with nutrition. They, they know nothing about nutrition either. It's what they were taught. Right. And it's, you know, they think that nutrition comes in a little plastic bottle with a bunch of pills in it. Right. Which is not. Nutritional deficiency is also a big, a big thing too. That's my field. <laughs> Through my years, I, I, I've helped quite a few people get better through nutrition. And it's the same, same thing. You, you, you go into a group and you, you claim, oh my gosh, I cured this. And you just get attacked. Oh yeah. No, it's I've pe- been called a snake oil salesman and yeah, yeah. taking advantage of people who are Quack. suffering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doctors don't know what they don't know. A lot of people are not ready to accept this, even people who are suffering. A lot of it has to do, I think, with a little bit of how it's pre- how it's presented. You know, if you tell somebody, well, you know, I so you got back pain? Oh, yeah, I know a little bit about that. It has to do with repressed emotions. They're going to be like, are you insane? I have a real problem. Are you calling me crazy? Right. It's not all in my head. What are you talking about? Oh, you know, and so it has to be gently introduced as like, I like the term stress-induced. Are you stressed out? Yeah. That's a lot easier to accept than this whole repressed emotion, distraction, psychological Freud type of theory. Right. Because that just says you're crazy. Right. Right. You don't have a back problem. You've got a repressed emotion problem. And they're going to go, get out of my face. (laughs) Right. Right. But if you say, you know, you got a lot of stress in your life, that changes the body a lot. I mean, people know that it can cause like hypertension and heart disease can cause tension headaches, can cause a bunch of stuff. Well, why not back pain? And, and you know, God bless Dr. Sarno, man, because... Oh, he's a genius. You know, I see what he did for Howard Stern. That's exactly how I found out about Sarno. Yeah. I was I mean, driving to work, struggling in my seat, trying to get comfortable, and Howard Stern starts talking about how this little five-foot-nothing Dr. Sarno in New York City yeah. saved his life. Yeah. Yeah, and and he gave like a eulogy on the air after Sarno passed away. It was beautiful. And yeah, and he's just like, this is my, this is my idol. This is this is my rock star. And it's it's. And Howard's met virtually every quote unquote rock star out there of the modern era. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean all of the successful, uh, famous people. But in his mind, this little Doctor Sarno was the guy. Yeah. That's good stuff. There's actually um, a website, I think it's called thankyoudoctorsarno.com or something. It's a whole mm. bunch of success stories where people would either write or record their success story. So that's a pretty interesting website to check out. Howard Stern was also very vocal on why isn't this in the medical system? Because they were they wanted to operate on Howard's shoulder. The Sarno got him out of it. And he's just like, you know, I, I was days away from a surgery, you know, I was going to get cut open if, if, if Dr. Sarno didn't intervene. So it's not going to be accepted by the mainstream medicine industry because it is a business and there is no way they would accept and teach and train concepts that would virtually guarantee the decimation of the pain management business, which is hundreds of millions of dollars a year, billions of dollars a year in pain management and pharmaceuticals and this and that. Why would they possibly embrace a concept that goes, you're not broken. There's nothing to fix. Go live your life. Because that's what Sarno would say. I've literally spoken to people who were in his office and were treated by him. They go, yeah, on the way out the door, Dr. Sarno goes, there's nothing wrong with you. Go live your life. (laughs) That was his message. And if you were treated by him, you went to seminars at his at his right. medical office. Right. It was education and a lot of calming down. He said, yeah, a certain percentage of people might need some therapy. It was a small percentage. But he, his basic core message is you're not broken. That thing you saw on the MRI, that's not causing the pain. How do we know? Because if you do MRIs on 
100 people with no back pain, 66 of the 100 will have bulging and herniated discs at one or more levels. New England Journal of Medicine. So two-thirds of the people are walking around with the same MRI report as you and no pain. Yeah. How come yours is from that thing seen on the MRI? It's not. Right. right. And so we know it. I mean, we've got people with the most horrible MRIs that are getting pain-free. Right. That means it's not the structure. It's a normal abnormality. Or That's something. what Sarno said, yeah. Right. Meaning we get older and we start to deteriorate a little. So if you're... It's called you know, aging. Yeah. Anyone over yeah, One aging. of my mentors used to say, you know, operating on degenerative disc disease would be like operating on my gray hair. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. It's... The normal part of aging. And I try to point out, you know, there's 80, 90 year old people who have no pain. How is that possible? And there's even, I, I keep on looking for it. I haven't found it yet, but I saw a, a chart that was showing the percentage of people that have various degenerative changes throughout their aging life. And the higher you get, the higher the percentage gets. And these are asymptomatic, asymptomatic people that have these changes on the MRI and x-rays, but no symptoms. There's a lot of evidence that the body's not the problem. Yeah. And, and again, this, this also relates to sleeping as well. I, I saw this one testimonial from this guy who dealt with insomnia for years and years and years. And then he read Dr. Sarno's book. And at some point he just got indifferent. And once he got indifferent, he started sleeping. Yeah, and I think it's a lot of the expectation because I think people with insomnia are dragging through the day and they're going, oh my God, I need to get some sleep. Yes. And then all day they're worrying about whether or not they're going to be able to get to sleep at night. So they yeah. go climbing into the bed at 10 p.m. and they go, oh my God, I hope I don't stay up all night. And they get themselves all stressed out about it. Well, they're flooding their body with adrenaline and cortisol, which is the survival mode. And so if you are in the stress response, climbing into bed, yep. oh my God, am I going to sleep? Your brain's going to go, don't sleep. That's dangerous. What are you doing? You're in danger. You're in survival mode. You're stressed out. Bed dread. I didn't hear that term, but that's, that's yeah. perfect. So I tell them, I'm like, look, remember a time when you were younger, could have been a year ago, could have been when you were 15 or could have been when you were eight, when you used to fall into bed and before you knew it, you're out. Out. And I said, just view your bed as your sanctuary, your place where you rest. And even if you're not asleep, your eyes are closed and you're resting. There's still benefit there. Yeah, there's a, that's and, a, med a meditation it, is still resting. Well, yeah. And so it's, it's really important to just not set the expectation that I'm not going to fall asleep. And even if you don't, so what? Yeah, this, this happened to me. I, uh, uh, went through some, some stuff. My sleep just vanished and it was a rough month. Yeah. But what kept me going is knowing that I didn't have a sleep problem before. This is before I discovered Sarno and you sure. and all that. And I'm like, this isn't a chronic thing. This is like an event, an episode, if you will. This is, this is going to end. Yeah. Especially if I put in a little bit of effort. I like the word episode. Yeah. Because I've had people saying when my pain kicks in, it's like I'm being attacked and they use all sorts of inflammatory language to describe it. It feels like this and that. And it's like words coming out of a horror movie, you know, the script from a horror movie with the graphic description and people are using that to describe their pain. Yeah. And I'm saying, stop using that language. Call it an episode, not an attack. Why? Because the brain's always listening. If you're saying it's it's like I'm being attacked with a knife, you're scaring the crap out of yourself. Yeah. All you're doing is keeping your brain in hypervigilance, and it's not going to settle down the, the brain and the nervous system. Yeah. If you're constantly referring to all of this as an attack. The famous book, The Four Agreements, be impeccable with your word. Yes. I'm even careful to stay away from sayings. Like somebody will say, oh, that, that, that pizza was to die for. Like, no, don't say that. Right. Like why? Yeah. why? Or you know who, uh, Marissa Peer is no Marissa Peer is a, a psychologist who's very, very well known for helping 
famous people. But she says the brain's always listening. And so if you're saying, oh, my God, I can't go to work. It's going to I'm going to die if I go to work. I can't believe it. This job is killing me. Monday morning, you wake up with the flu or a stomach ache. Yeah. The brain is just going, oh, we're not going to let you go to work because that's dangerous. It's going to kill you. Yeah. And the brain's always listening. So she's an interesting person for anybody watching. Marissa Peer, P-E-E-R. And uh, she has a book or a whole series of things uh, called I Am Enough. Because so many people are walking around going, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm, I'm all messed up. And, da, 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 da. and, you know, we just talk ourselves into a corner. Imagine if you just woke up every day and just knew I'm enough. Whatever happens, it happens, but I'm, I'm enough. Mm. She's interesting. Well, shout out to her. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, looking at kids, you know, you've heard about kids who are like, oh, I can't go to school. I have a tummy ache. The parents are like, ah, you're faking it. Go to school. I don't think the kids are faking it. I think the kid was like bullied yesterday, is terrified of going to school today, and the brain is trying to protect them. Here's some stomach pain so you sure. don't have to go. Sure. I don't think the kids are faking it. They really don't feel no, well. I had I had stomach issues freshman high school. I did not I was not adjusting well to high school. Sure. And I, I remember having a lot of stomach issues. I forgot about it till right you now. Weren't, you weren't faking it though. No, I wasn't faking it. Not at all. It was just a reaction in your body to your emotional world. The mind body syndrome. Exactly. It's probably the best name for it, TMS. I, you know, I've, I've heard terms like uh, nervous system overload. It's just your nervous system. It's just so highly vigilant. Everything seems dangerous. Yeah. And once it gets to a certain point, it overflows. Um, neural circuit pain is one of the newer terms. Dr. Schubner is using neural circuit pain. He's basically, he taught me that um, pain is a decision made in the brain based on the inputs. What happened to me was when I was going through that sleeping, no sleep episode, my calves went. Charlie in horse? The, in the middle of the night, Charlie horse, both legs for about two or three nights straight. And they were never the same since. And. Wow. Yeah. And I'm a walker, like walking is my deal. And so that was taken away from me. Is it still? Since I discovered Dr. Sarno and discovered your videos, there's still pain, but I'm walking. And I took my compression socks off. Awesome. <laughs> I was wearing compression socks for two months. Sure. And thinking that it makes it better. And the compression socks must have been signaling to my brain that there's something wrong with my calves. Anytime you treat your body, you're telling the brain, this is a body problem. As long as the brain believes there's a body problem, what do you think it's going to do every time you move that right. part of the body? Right. The brain's going to go, stop it. And, and I started walking. I said, screw it. And I started slow, five minutes a day. And now I'm doing 20 minutes, three times a day. And, you know, do they get sore? Yeah, they get sore, but there's, it's healing. It's going to heal. Well, it's not even that it's healing. It's just that the brain is slowly learning that you're okay. Because a Charlie horse does create a certain amount of muscle tension. In other words, you know, that, that spasm, because yeah. I get them every once in a while, not often, a few times a year, I'll get like a Charlie horse. I'll wake up, ah, I'll, I'll like roll over and stretch and it, I'll just feel it. And it just, yeah. Yep. And you wake up, you're like, ah, oh, and you're trying to find out, do I stretch my toe this way or that way? And yeah. To figure yeah. out how to let it go. But then when you get up in the morning, you walk and you like put weight on it. It hurts. So I don't think that's a hundred percent mind body because three days later you feel fine. Right. So I think that spasm for that length of time might create a little bit of tissue damage, but it heals. So if that was months ago, your legs have already healed. The brain has remembered, right? And even be impeccable with your word. You just said they've never been the same since. Mm. There, you, there it is. Right? There <laughs> so it is. there's a belief system that goes, I still got a problem with my calves. I got to detox that out. <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because again, I've had Charlie horses 
you know, probably dozens of them throughout my life. I never, they never become chronic because I don't freak out about them. But I also didn't have them three days in a row, which could certainly have a psychological impact that maybe one did. Right. You know, and who knows why they start. Some yeah, people well, say dehydration, potassium. There's all sorts of theories yeah. and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, don't stress, stress about them. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. freak out about them. Know that your body will be fine. It, it was the perfect storm for me. I, I didn't have the sleep. I was under a lot of stress. I was under anxiety, passing in the family, COVID. I didn't have it, but a family member had it. And it was the perfect storm. And my calves just, they yeah. clenched. Could, could have been TMS, could have been just a little dehydration or something going on. Could have been too much stress combined with a little, who knows? We don't have to figure it out. The key is, Charlie horses are not long-term damaging right. events. Right. And so whatever happens in that time frame that your muscles are just completely in spasm heals in a matter of days. The memory stays. It's like PTSD. And know? then you get afraid of going to sleep because you don't want it to happen again because it was so painful because you woke up in the middle of the night and your legs were like, ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. And then the lack of sleep. Sleep is is a huge deal mm -hmm. because we just need it for mental health, physical health. Sure do. Everything. So if sleep is problematic, everything else gets more difficult. Yep. Everything from everything. thinking and being productive and, you know, everything. focusing and digestion and everything else, recovery, yeah. everything gets more difficult without sleep. That doesn't mean we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves that we have to sleep. Oh my God. Sleep has never been difficult for most of us up until the time that it became difficult. Prior to that, like, I don't have a problem sleeping. I've had some sleepless nights, but... Okay. Everybody's everybody's had a few, but but some people it becomes chronic. Yeah, and that's what that's and what I, I was and scared I said of. To people, I said, all right. So they're like, yeah, but every night I wake up at two in the morning. I'm like, okay. And how do you respond when you wake up at two in the morning? You know how I respond when I wake up at two in the morning? Look at the clock. Oh, good, I got more hours. And I roll over. Whereas somebody with a sleep problem wakes up at two in the morning and goes, ah. So I'm awake again. Why right. does it keep happening? And then they get pissed off and then they freak out. They turn on the stress response and then they can't fall back asleep. Yep. Well, what that's would happen if they it. just said, oh my God, this is great. I get to stay in bed for a few more hours. Awesome. I got four more hours sleep or five more hours sleep. Yep. This is great. Oh, let me roll over and get comfortable. As opposed to becoming enraged by the fact that they woke up in the middle of the night. Or some people say, just go do some work. You'll be tired well, again in an hour. Sometimes that can be useful, especially if you're staring up at the ceiling. Yeah, some people get up out of bed and they just kind of break up their rest into chunks. Not saying that's right or wrong. I don't know. But I know if you wake up and you get pissed off that you're up. It's a problem. It's going to be tough to fall back asleep because yep. you just fired up the adrenaline. Yep. Yep. No, I've been there, man. I was sleeping... I don't know, three days a week. Oh, wow. And I never experienced anything like that in my life. I was meditating a lot because that was my rest. That became my rest. Yeah. And people were like, how are you even functioning? It must be from the meditation. Yeah, I think at, at a certain point in time, the intelligence in the body just takes over and you crash. And hopefully you fall asleep, even if it's for an hour or two. Well, th th that's what a friend of mine said who was a social worker, he was like, your body is going to sleep. You can't not sleep. It's impossible. So he's like, so forget it. In other words, don't worry about whether or not you're sleeping right now. Yeah. Just, okay, so I'm awake. So what? Yeah, that's it. You have to be indifferent. That That's that's the deal. That's the medicine is well, to be like indifferent. It's like acceptance of where you are now. Yeah. A radical acceptance of what currently is last night okay <laughs> you, you love these stories so oh of course i went for a walk my third walk of the day plus i mowed the lawn end up end up talking to uh 
the mom, you went for three walks plus mow the lawn. Don't overdo it, Kevin. Don't overdo it. You don't want to throw your calves out again. That would be horrible. Mom, shh, shh, stop it. Don't <laughs> say that. Don't say that. And I text her back. It's a, don't be positive here. Okay, please. Don't talk about it at all. Don't talk about it at all. And guess what? I had trouble sleeping last night. Yeah. I handle oh. it differently now. I, I didn't care. Because you, you're farther along in your journey that you knew how to approach it. I did some praying, did some meditation. I got up, went downstairs, talked to the dog <laughs> who was sleeping beautifully, I might add, came back upstairs. And then you left was, the dog awake and the dog's like, I can't believe he woke me up. <laughs> and I fell asleep and, and I only got maybe four hours of sleep and I'm fine today. I'm fine. I'm, yeah. I'm in good spirits because... I've learned how to get through this and it's just going to get, keep getting better and better and better. So my suggestion is to coach those people around you to stop talking about these things. Mm. Right. I did a video just recently about this complaining help. Not at all. Yeah. All it does is keep you stuck on the problem. And so um, Dr. Hanscom actually, when he meets with a new client patient, whatever he's calling them, um, he'll have the person coming in who's got the chronic pain and he will have their family come in with them. And everybody has to agree to stop talking about the chronic pain. All of them, whole family. He says, if you want to talk to somebody about chronic pain, talk to me. I'm your practitioner, nobody else, because this is happening through neuroplasticity, meaning you're using those wires and it, the, you know, the more you use them, the more they are going to stick around. And my example is, you know, I learned Spanish in high school, two years of Spanish, and I got to a certain degree of proficiency enough to pass the class and graduate. Great. Now, if I kept on speaking Spanish every single day and focusing on it every single day, I shouldn't be upset now that I could still speak Spanish. You know what happened to me? I said, I don't need to do this anymore. And I went on and I focused on freshman year of college. What did my brain do? Forget it. Huh. He's not looking at Spanish anymore. We don't need that. And it let go of those connections. But had I kept on speaking that, the language, I would have continued to remember it. Yep. So if you want your body and brain to forget about chronic pain, spend as little time thinking about focusing on it and trying to fix it as possible. That's right. Shift your attention back to living your life. Well, that's hard to do if you're terrified why you have pain, which is why accurate knowledge is the starting point. Yep. which is why Sarno was so darn successful. He had 200 pages in those books, the book you're reading, 98% of it is accurate knowledge. Yeah. He's got a page and a half of what to do about it. Right. Because fear and attention are the two things that fuel persistent symptoms. Well, if you can, with accurate knowledge, take the fear from way up here down to here, there's no fuel. Right. And then you're not going to focus on it because you're not afraid of it. And so you're going to get back to whatever you were doing. Yeah. So you take away fear and attention. That's the game, which is why I think there are certain people who can read a book and get better. It's a small fraction of a percentage, not a lot of people, but the people that are able to read a book and get better is because they go, Holy cow, I'm okay. And their fear drops completely to the floor. They're no longer afraid of it. And they go, I'm going golfing tomorrow. They're back at it. And their fear is gone. The focus is gone. There's no fuel. The brain just gets bored and turns it off. It doesn't have to be complicated. I think sometimes with chronic pain, the less you do, the faster you get better. So when I work with individual coaching clients, I don't give them a checklist of things they have to do every day to get better. Because the more you do, the more you're focused on and thinking about and monitoring your pain which means you're using those neural pathways. Mm. Relax, you're not broken. Yeah. Sarno, TMS 101, first day of class. Normal abnormalities, you're not broken. Period. Done. If you get that and you stop thinking you're broken, brain's going to get the message eventually and leave, leave you alone. It's not complicated. No, it's not. And even with regard to your walking, stop timing it. 
go for a walk, just go for a walk. Look at your clock because you're like, oh, if I go 22 minutes, I might start hurting again. <laughs> right. I'm not right. kidding. I mean, right. people yeah. will say, oh, I can walk to the end of the driveway and back. But boy, if I try to go down the street, I'm in trouble. Right. It's a belief system and your brain is going, what are you doing? That's dangerous. Don't go down the street. Stop at the end of your driveway. You can get to the mailbox. I'll leave you alone with that. But oh, don't go past that. Right. Because you're just confirming the brain's perception that too much walking is dangerous. You don't you can't walk too much. Your feet are going to start hurting before your calves should start hurting. It's just the fear that keeps it alive. Right. So right. it's my take, my little bit of coaching <laughs> to you. So the brain is causing the muscles to tighten up. The brain is causing the pain. Yeah. Look, tight muscles are a result, not a cause, right? Because if somebody were to be like, I'm going to punch you, what do you do? You tense up, right? It's a protective mechanism. So if your brain is going, he's walking again, it's going to tense up along with the pain. Is the pain causing the tense muscles? Is the tense muscles causing the pain? I don't know. It doesn't matter. The solution isn't to figure out how to stretch and strengthen the muscles that's the result happening up here you're afraid of walking too far there's no reason to just like you didn't ever forget how to sleep you didn't forget how to walk why can't you you know 20 20 20 why can't you walk for an hour right. one shot because you're afraid <laughs> no offense no not I, fun at all I, but i agree there's a belief system that goes i can't do that much unless right. i break it up Right. Which to me says there's still a belief that your calves are the problem. Mm. No, the belief that the calves are a problem is more powerful than any temporary muscle issues. Right. Look, when you when you work out your biceps, lifting weights, mm. you know, you're sore for a couple of days, right? Next time you do this, you're like, oh, well, that's right. I was lifting weights yesterday. You don't worry about it. I don't think the calf pain after a spasm from a charley horse is much different than the exercise soreness from lifting weights. But it's the fear, especially when it happened the next night and then the next night, it's like traumatizing. PTSD. And all of a sudden it locked in as I got a major problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to encourage you to start taking on the belief that your calves are fine already. You just, your brain just doesn't know that yet. And so it's your job to reassure yourself that I'm fine. I can do whatever I want. It's the brain's perception of danger that's keeping it persistent and saying, because right. you didn't atrophy so much in the past several months that you got to totally rehab your calf muscles. Because when you weren't working your calf muscles for the past few months, what about your thighs and your hamstrings? Did they atrophy as well? No. <laughs> Nothing did. There's people who sit on the couch for 30 years and they can still walk for three miles. Right. So just a little encouragement for you. I appreciate this it. This is not a body problem. It's a brain perception that there's a body problem. And where can somebody come and get more info about your work and your coaching? Yeah, people can find me at painforyou.com or danbuglio.com. I do two types of coaching, both one-on-one -on -one individual as well as a group program. Great. Dan, thank you for your time today. Listen, man, I appreciate it. This has been a fun conversation. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.